Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the GGDA's July meeting. Thank you all. Woo! Yay! Very happy to be doing this from Sprocket Creative. I think you just saw their trailer online. Everybody here didn't, but we get to see the real cool office. Maybe we'll give you a shot at this place at one point, but we're afraid if we do, you'll all start in your forcing your resumes on them and trying to work here just to play with all the action figures that line this, uh, <laughs> line this place. Usually we'll start with announcements. We're going to save most of our announcements for the end since we are doing the live stream tonight. Hi, everybody out there in the intrawebs living in those tubes and, uh, and wires. But uh, I did want to say that we will have another stream Thursday at 7 p.m., probably be a play test of Fading Sun's Noble Armada. And this weekend on Saturday, we're going to have a full day of game development sessions from SimFest at Columbus State University uh, on a whole variety of topics running from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. So make sure you tune in again Saturday. Uh, I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves. Tonight we are talking about secrets of art production, focusing on both interactive and non-interactive uh, art. One thing that we see both in the game world and outside is how many chances there are for projects to go off the rails when you're doing really cool, really unique art projects. And we're bringing in some uh, excellent pros to keep to do, talk about how not to go off the rails, how not to crash in the wall, how not to have your stuff look like the stick figures you did in fifth grade. So I'm Andrew Greenberg. I'm the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association. I'll be moderating, which means I get to get these guys to talk all the time, starting to my left. If you'd introduce yourself, please, sir. Uh, Dean Velez, creative director of Sprocket. And talk about some of the projects you've done. For instance, Victoria Frankenstein. Um, so we've been here for about uh, three years, and most of our work is with Cartoon Network uh, Latin America. But go out on a, a lark and actually start creating original content. So we are working on an episodic 360 uh, mystery called Victoria Frankenstein 360. Uh, the premise of it is that it's the year 2070. You've been sent to the Frankenstein castle, uh, which is now demolished, and we found out there is some subterranean caverns. And while you go down to these caverns, you find out that Victor Frankenstein wasn't alone. He did have other scientists helping him, and those scientists actually built a lot of uh, other creations before actually coming to the Frankenstein monster. Um, and your job is to find out who those monsters are and who those scientists were, and are they still alive? Very cool. Looking forward to trying that one out. And uh, to his left. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Apple. I'm 3D director at Floyd County Productions. We do a little show called Archer on the FX network. Uh, we're also currently ramping up to begin production on a new Netflix movie called America the Movie. Uh, what can I say about it? I came out of game development, uh, electronic gaming in the 90s, and I've done a lot of illustration work for conventional gaming, and now I'm in television somehow, miraculously. So hopefully I can pull up a few old war stories to share today. And I was uh, very honored to have worked with Chris a number of years ago on a game called Dungeon Lords, and also to have had Dean as a speaker at a number of our events, including Siege and our college fairs and so on. Excellent speaker. So very glad to have both of you to offer insights on this. The whole idea of this is to go beyond the general um, introductory talks on our production, really delve into what works, what doesn't work, and I thought we'd actually start by talking about what doesn't work. So I've got a classic example I throw out because I just think it hit all of the problems. We were consultants on a um, virtual history game that was going to try and reenact the entire Pacific War, being funded by a Japanese company, so you had to have great details for being both Japan and the United States and Britain, et cetera. And if you'd had a budget like World of Plains, it could have been wonderful, but it was a classic project of under-budgeted, over-ambitious, way too much scope, not enough uh, talent, and not nearly enough time. And it was very interesting and very sad to be on the inside when everything starts to implode under those sorts of, um, under those sorts of situations. And it was very funny in a very tragic way because there are the battleships that sink and cost lots of lives in that. And it was while we were starting to work with them on putting together art on a battleship sinking that the whole project started going with it. <laughs> and I found it just a perfect analogy for what happened. <clears throat> so I'd asked our panelists, we have a number of topics to discuss, I'd ask them to think about things that had gone wrong. What are those, some of those examples 
Uh, and I hadn't asked this before, but if there are warning signs along the way, and I think I named some of the more obvious ones, but would definitely love to get input from our panelists. Any war stories you can tell us, get it, virtual war, uh, war stories, uh, on things that go wrong. Dean, you wanna, I see you waving the microphone. Yeah, so <coughs> this is a broadcast story. Um, <laughs> basically, I was hired to create a news package for um, Channel 9 um, in uh, DC and built everything, everybody signed off on it, it's all going well, and then all of a sudden we're, you know, have to travel to DC and kind of present what we have so far. And what I didn't know was they changed the amount of people who had to sign off from three to 13. <laughs> and no one warned me, no one warned me at all. So I walk into this office, and it's huge, and there's this big conference table, and there's 13 people there. And I remember uh, leaning over to the art director and, and saying, hey, uh, what's going on? And it's like, well, this is, this is the committee to determine um, if we go with this news package or not. I'm like, okay, well, you kind of already signed off on it, but sure, well, let's do this. I uh, sit down, and they got caught up on the logo because somehow the HR director was part of this committee, and the logo reminded her of a lifesaver. <laughs> and we sat, and I'm not even kidding, we sat for 30 good minutes talking about lifesavers. And I'm just sitting there, and I have nobody with me, and I'm just going, how do I stop this? This is not stopping. Everybody has now sees it as a lifesaver. And they're talking about their experiences as children with lifesavers <laughs> and how it's kind of awesome because it brings them back to these great memories. And all I'm thinking is, are you freaking <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> this, is, this is three months of work. <laughs> like, like, we're launching. <laughs> this logo is everywhere. Uh, needless to say, um, I was able to get to my boss and their higher up and, and shut the whole thing down um, and go back and, and uh, approve the logo, but only because I said it's going to cost so much money. And that's the only thing that stopped them because everybody in that room wanted a different logo because they were uh, thinking it was a lifesaver. How often the budget will rule. Chris, any uh, horror stories you want to, you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, there were. <clears throat> This is a case of a couple of dodged bullets that, uh, that we witnessed. And these are both kind of famous vaporware projects. But back when I was with Heuristic Park, we went out to Virgin Interactive, which was then our publisher. And uh, we had shown our graphics, which had gotten a lot of positive buzz. Uh, Origin, uh, not Origin, uh, E3 had been in Atlanta for two years running. And people had a chance to see what we were doing. And, really positive response. So we were flown out to Virgin Interactive to talk about working on two of their big projects that they had coming up. One of them was called Freak Boy for the N64, which was a project which had been completely restarted twice by the time we went out to talk to the team. And the other one was a project called Thrill Kill. Um, Freak Boy was about this weird crystalline polygon creature and he had weird crystalline polygon powers and we were supposed to help them produce graphics but the lead on that project who was going to talk to us did not make the meeting because it was Orange County and the surf was gnarly that day. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that two people had been flown out at publisher expense meant less to him than that. So he didn't show up. Uh, and then uh, we talked to the Thrill Kill guys and learned that Thrill Kill had its origins as a, an Aztec basketball game. Uh, the Aztecs play particularly violent, played a, this violent kind of basketball. And they had spent a lot of development money trying to simulate that before someone pointed out to them that nobody really cares much about <laughs> Aztec basketball. There's not a big fan following. So then they looked at the news and saw that it, you know, at that point in the 90s, a lot of religious groups were out uh, protesting violent video games. And those games were doing really well as a result of that. Every time someone shoved a, a news camera in front of some protesters, sales figures went up. So they decided their whole concept of the game was to make the most controversial, inappropriate game 
they could possibly make, and that was <laughs> thrill killed. Uh, we passed on both of those. We, decided, we worked on another project called Knox, which did okay. But both of those projects, uh, Freak Boy went into a third iteration before finally dying a slow death, and Thrill Kill made it through until Virgin Interactive imploded, and they were bought out by a division of EA who said, oh, hell no, we're not going to put out this violent death game and for, for PlayStation. Um, and, and the bullet there was really two projects that started out with no idea what they wanted to be and just sort of grasped in the dark and went through several complete overhauls where they were completely redesigned at great expense uh, before they eventually died a slow and predictable <laughs> death. So, you know, the most obvious part of a pipeline working would be knowing what the hell you're trying to make when you start out. So, Yeah, I love these stories because they, I think, represent uh, the perfect triangle of production. So when we talk about the, tr the production triangle, you're talking about the schedule time or production pipeline as one leg of the triangle. You're talking about your people as the second, and then your money, your resources. Time, money, resources uh, are time, money, people are kind of the way you break it down. But for this, I think of the pipeline, the schedule, the talent, and how much money can you bring to bear on the project. I think these touch on all of those. So I'd love to start by talking about those done correctly. What do people need to look at? What does an art director or a project lead, creative director, need to look at? Maybe we'll start with the uh, production line. What is a production I don't want to talk about the timeline, but uh, the phases of production that you need to keep in mind when you're figuring out that time part of the triangle. Either one of you want to jump on that? Okay. <clears throat> so for us, um, a lot of the times when we're doing production, and, and since we're doing broadcast, it might be a little bit different than gaming, um, but we lose money when we mis make mistakes in, in the animation part of it. Um, so for us, everything is... Uh, scripting and storyboarding, scripting and storyboarding over and over again um, to get the client um, happy with that. Uh, most of the times, if we get that part correctly, uh, we do one pass on the animation. If we do it incorrectly, if we skip a step, we are bleeding money immediately because what happens is we're designing in the animation. So we're spending all this time to render, all of this time, time to model, all of this time to animate, and then the client's making changes. Um, that stuff has to start all over again. So we haven't, we haven't had that problem maybe once since we've been here um, and decided, and it was basically the client didn't have a big budget, so we decided to get rid of all of the storyboarding and the conceptual to save money because they just didn't have it. And it cost more. It just absolutely cost more. So for us, making sure we go through, through that flow um, and sticking to it, no matter if the job is big or small, but you still, you still uh, keep to that flow of doing the conceptual, uh, having the back and forth with the clients. I think the most important part is for the clients to feel they're involved. So they can't really get involved in our animation. Uh, at that point, we just have to work. But while we're talking about scripts, they can, of course, get involved. While we're talking about um, character design or text choices, they can, of course, get involved in those points. And as long as they're involved, when it gets to the animation part, they're happy because uh, they spent a lot of money. And they want to know that you're building something that they want as opposed to um, being some crazy artist and just going, hey, I'm just going to do this and then I'm going to show it to you, and then I'm cashing that check. <laughs> that doesn't work. I don't think it works for anybody. I know it's never worked for me as many times as I've tried. Um, it has always cost me more money. So I think if you have a workflow and it's written down, it's the gospel, uh, and you just stick to it. No matter what, you stick to it, and even if, um, you know, like I said, if the budget isn't there, you still stick to it because in the long run, you're going to get a better project, and you're going to get a happier client, and maybe even repeat work. What about you, Chris? You have to deal with a fairly sizable team on Archer. Uh, we do, and we have a unique challenge in that uh, as, a, as 3D artists on Archer, we are the one 3D component of a 2D pipeline. 
which was unusual for me coming out of gaming. Everybody I worked with at game companies spoke some version of 3D. They may be coming at it from the art side, they may be coming at it from the programming side, but they understood where we were going with it. And it's much more challenging as 3D director to communicate the possibilities and needs of 3D to a group of artists who don't work in 3D and to art directors who don't work in 3D. But we're fortunate in that we're a, we're a season team. I mean, we're about to start our ninth season on Archer, so uh, that's an incredible amount of time for a, <laughs> for an animated show to run. You know, The Simpsons notwithstanding. Well, you're not in Korea either. Right, right. And for an American team, yeah. And on top of that, it's all it's all done here. Um, and uh, you know, there there are tremendous advantages to being able to walk across the room and talk to the person who's going to be receiving your graphics and, and talk to them about what their needs are. And those needs may not be what the art director thought they were because he's not hands-on in that department either. So one of the things that I've tried to bring since I've taken over the department is just over-communicate. Talk, talk, talk. Make sure everybody knows what we're doing, what what's uh, I'm understanding their needs, and if there's a miscommunication with any other department, they know where we are and uh, where things stand in the pipeline. We, you know, it's, it's a weekly show. We don't have clients, which I'm thankful for. As a freelancer, I dealt with lots and lots of clients, and you know, they may not understand the process at all. I'm dealing with professionals who are part of a team. Everybody's working toward the same goal, which is a tremendous advantage. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think still you, you, have to, you have to reach across department divides. You have to talk to people. You have to understand what's going on. I came out of the background department in, at Floyd County. One of my primary clients, to the extent that we have one, is the background department. Our, we pre-visualize all of the all of the scenery in Archer is comes through us and then it goes to them to paint in the Archer style, to romance, to add lighting and other special props. Uh, I know that process, so I was able to reach across to the current background director and really improve workflow between those two departments. So uh, I think communication is key, particularly when you're on a project where you are under the gun constantly. We have a very short turnaround time and things can't be allowed to, to slip much. And we're very fortunate, Floyd, that we don't slip much. We keep the trains running on time. I love what you said about over-communication, which is completely different from schedule more meetings. And uh, one of the, uh, the secrets are how do you effectively communicate in a creative environment? And meetings and long design docs are not necessarily the trick. Um, I'd love to get your ideas on some of these tricks. When Chris and I worked on a game together, probably the most effective communication done at that company was through cigarette breaks. I don't think you smoke. I didn't smoke. But, but the, uh, the guy who ran the company was a smoker. Or, uh, the other the lead artist was, who's now at high res and one of the leads at high res was a smoker. So yeah, if you wanted to know what was going on, you, you waited through the cigarette smoke. And, but those are very effective. They're very focused because they're going to have five minutes to smoke and get back to work. Conversations are very much on point at that, uh, at that stage. Everybody, you might not even go in planning to talk about something. Something will come up and suddenly you'll work through a situation, just find out what the other person is doing. The more official term is water cooler conversations. Theoretically, people stand around the water cooler drinking. But I love the idea of very pointed, very efficient five to ten minute conversations that really get your day, uh, your whatever roles, you, or whatever projects you're working on, get it across to the rest of your team and even those people in other companies. Do you have any other tips for uh, over communicating effectively? done in a quick trip to the break room with one of my leads, uh, catching up, talking about any business that, you know, maybe you don't want to talk about in front of the whole team. Uh, and, uh, and that's a, or, or a smoke break. I, I have, you know, one of my technical guys is, is a smoker, so even though I don't, I've spent a few smoke breaks out, out uh, in front of the building with him. 
So those short, uh, those short breaks are very important or not being afraid to deliver bad news is very important. Uh, that's one of the things that I found that uh, was intimidating when I took the job, but if, if you walk into a situation where something isn't working right and you can articulate clearly why it's not working right and have a backup plan, here's, here's what I intend to do about it. Do you have any suggestions? You know, does that sound like a good idea to you? If you can get that out early before it becomes a train wreck, uh, if you can let everybody know this is a problem, it's a problem for very good reasons, here's what we're doing about it, you will be way ahead of the game. The, the worst thing that can happen is you know, you're due to hand something off to somebody else and it's not ready and nobody knew in advance and suddenly you're having to hem and haw about why something isn't there on time. Uh, you know, it's, it's great to brainstorm good ideas, but, you know, just being able to communicate through the problems that inevitably come up and, and being flexible about how to fix things or the direction something needs to go. Uh, you know, I, I told the story about the projects that didn't know what they want to be, but that doesn't mean that when you have a plan of action, it's always inflexible. Things do change and you come up with a better way or a more economical way to do something. You know, this, this may not be as much of a wow visual, but we can do this on budget and still meet our deadlines. So let's talk it out and figure out what we can do feasibly. So those are all important conversations to have. What about you, Dean? Is the best form of communication a boot to the head? I shouldn't say that when I'm in the little chair. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're a lot different um, in, in size of our crew. Um, I mean, this, uh, I know you guys out there in internet land can't see this, but uh, we all work in this studio where we all can see each other and hear each other uh, all the time. Um, the way my desk faces, basically I can see every single computer um, with the guys who are working with me. Um, so how we bring people in is an apprentice program. So they actually have to work with us for three months actually learning our process. So in that three months, once they understand our process, once they understand how we do meetings, how we communicate, we don't have to really worry about it after that. Um, and, and my sideline is actually uh, teaching uh, and training. So for me, it's being able to walk by somebody's computer and not have to talk to them to know they're in trouble. Um, to see something and go, okay, well, I'm going to troubleshoot this. I'm going to troubleshoot that. Uh, how I schedule it is my bathroom breaks and my coffee breaks. <laughs> so it's basically when I got to go to the bathroom, I look at everybody's computer. <laughs> when I get my coffee, I look at everybody's computer. I might not actually interact with them. Um, it's just, just walking from, from computer to computer, um, getting my coffee, coming back down, and if I see someone's in trouble, um, I say something like, where are we at, what are we doing, uh, how can I help, or what the hell is that? <laughs> that is not what I wanted. That is so not what I wanted. Um, and also through that three month process, they get to know me, and they get to know that I don't kind of sugarcoat stuff, and I don't really have a pleasant personality. Uh, I'm a pleasant person. <laughs> Understand, I'm a pleasant person, not you, don't look and say I'm not. <laughs> I'm a pleasant person, but I don't have a pleasant personality because I tell them all, uh, it's just a job. It's just a job and we gotta get it done and I don't have time for small talk at your, at your computer. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you what needs to happen and we're gonna get this done and we're gonna move on. Um, this, and we have, and every, every day we have one meeting. We have a morning meeting. And our morning meeting is not a scheduled 30 minute meeting or a 10, 10 minute meeting, as my business partner will say. Uh, do we really need to talk for four hours? <laughs> uh, we have meetings as long as they take. And our meetings aren't sometimes about the jobs. Sometimes the meeting's about our motions. <laughs> and, and we do some really stupid meetings, to be totally honest, uh, where we talk about why did that work for that movie? Let's dissect this because we're kind of a training training facility at the same time. So for us, leaving it where anybody can say anything they want and leaving the, the, the kind of channels of communication open where if someone's sitting over on the side and they go, Dean, I go, hold on, let me set this, save this, I'll be right there. Um, because I only have to walk 10 feet. Uh, keeps the, the line of communication open. Um, it just so happens that my business partner is right there, so I just yell 
hey, you got a second? And he goes, no, most of the time. Uh, and then when he says yes, I just come in there for five minutes. We go, hey, blah, 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 what's this? He tells me, and I just go back to my desk. Uh, sometimes as I'm walking through the hall, I'll just yell out the information instead of calling a meeting. Hey, here's information. <laughs> All right, let's get to work. Um, so, so we keep it open, and, I, and we don't keep it, um, we, everything's transparent. Everything is absolutely transparent. Uh, I say if the guys, you don't understand something um, and you don't want to look silly in front of everybody else, pull me over to the room and I'll answer whatever question you want about anything. Uh, I know nothing about uh, how you should live your life, but I will tell you how I feel about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I think we try and keep it humorous so that no one ever feels embarrassed by not having information or being able to come to me for information uh, and just having an, an easy back and forth. And telling everybody who works uh, on this side, the, the motion graphic side, that if I say something inappropriate, go to Billy. And uh, he will straighten me out. And that's how they get their power. <laughs> and I keep mine. And just remember, if you're stressing him, the more coffee breaks he takes, that's linked to the more bathroom breaks he takes. So keep that uh, down. And I'll, I'll throw up. If I'm out of my seat, there's trouble. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll throw out one other set of tips for virtual offices, or virtual teams, distributed teams. One thing I've definitely discovered there is there's a lot of communication going on and people stop being able to prioritize it. What is actually important? What do I actually need to worry about? Uh, and that is where those flags, those various tags and so on really come into use. I kind of, I've, I've found those the silliest things when they started being introduced in my email programs back in the mid-90s and uh, have since found that when I tag something, if I don't tag very much, that really helps. This is the one thing that those folks who are working in California, China, or whatever, need to know that's going on. And you can look at the others when you get a chance. Uh, really, I found that to be a real important point on distributed teams. But let's keep talking about the people, because I found this, this has really been tying over to the actual, I hate the word talent. There are people. They're the ones who have all these emotions Dean keeps talking about. We don't admit that those exist in game development, but apparently they do. So. Uh, Chris, I'd really love your take on who are the people who work best in this environment? What are those, um, what are those uh, personality, I don't want to say personality factors, what are the skills, what's the temperament, what makes someone a fit? And I'm, I'm aiming, calling you out on this one because I know you're looking for those people right now. Uh, you want somebody who's really even. Uh, I don't know that they need to be people person, you know, material. You, you, deal with artists, often they're kind of introverted. Uh, one of my 3D guys would always get frustrated. He would walk around and say, nobody makes eye contact here. You know, it's like, well, some people are extroverts here and will, you know, happily get in a conversation in the break room with you. And a lot of people are very shy. But when it comes time to sit down and work, they're in their desk, they're focused, uh, and they're not, uh, they're not playing drama games in an environment where you've got a, a hundred people working on a TV show trying to get out. Uh, we've had a, a few of those at, uh, at companies I've worked with, and uh, you know they, they don't hang around long. The people who get the work done and don't create problems are going to do well in a production environment, and I. I had some question about that was being true at Floyd County because I am a really quiet guy. I sit at my desk, I get my job done, I go home. I'm not super sociable, I'm not super antisocial, but I'm, I'm never a problem. And uh, when I was suddenly offered the 3D department, I was like, yeah, somebody did in fact notice that I don't make a lot of problems and I just do my work. And uh, you know, I, I think that's invaluable in any sort of production environment, whether you're in a, a small team like, uh, like this or what I was at at Heuristic Park or Proto Terra, uh, or something where, you know, we may have 200 people at Floyd County when we're running multiple projects. You really want people who can sit down and just get the job done. And if they're having problems with people, can articulate it in a productive way and not blow up on you, so. I would say I'm the exact opposite. <laughs> uh, I would say I'm the biggest problem here. <laughs> and the loudest uh, person and the most drama uh, queen. 
Uh, <laughs> and I say that with joy and happiness. Uh, my, my take on it is, it, it is true, you gotta find the people that aren't gonna make real drama. Um, there's, there's levels of drama, there's fun drama, and then there's that drama where you're like, oh God, get out. Um, you have to get out now. I might be physical and I might push you out the door, <laughs> but you were in my way. Um, we have been lucky not to have a lot of that. And we kind of, like I said, we go through this three month, three month process and the vetting process is so that they understand our, our workflow. But more importantly, in those three months, they know that they're not insured a position in this at all. So in that three months, I'm listening to every single word they say, every movement they make, um, how they look at me when I'm talking to them with a critique. Um, I've been teaching for 15 years, so I kind of know when it's going you know, off the rails. And I can tell from body language. Um, I talk to them all the time about that. I, I tell them, I, I don't exaggerate, when I say everything you do in this three months is determining if you stay or if you go. That means if you shrug the wrong way, if you pick up your cell phone, um, if you don't make eye contact with me when I'm telling you something important, if you don't understand um, what, I, what I just said to you, and if you don't write it down, everybody's required to have notebooks, especially in that first three months, so that they can write down anything I say. And I keep a notebook with every conversation, and I write down everything I say and what they say. Um, once they get past those three months, you really, you're, you're kind of safe. You're, there's nothing that's, that's going to really happen. Um, I think the, the thing with artists in general is they feel heavily about the work that they create. I mean, more so than anybody I've ever met, uh, it's a personal thing with them. And a lot of the times if we do run into a problem is they got invested in something that might be changing on them constantly, and they don't understand. And it's kind of like, um, you know, I'm going to kill your baby, and I'm going to give you a new one tomorrow. Um, and they don't want a new baby. They like their baby. They took their baby to the park. They put their baby in a stroller. Um, they bought freaking, uh, you know, some nice toys for their baby. And I just threw it outside and said, wolves, come and eat this baby, because I don't care about it. The client doesn't care about it. And no one wants you to have another baby like this. I'm just trying to paint a picture of what's happening. <laughs> so anyways, um, and it's trying to get them back, in, back involved. Sometimes, I, you know, when that happens, um, they, they lose momentum. And it's, it's crazy to see it because I don't even think they understand that they, they've lost momentum. Like you'll ask them, are they okay? And it's like, yeah, I'm fine. It's like, no, you're not. I can see it from your body language. I can see it where your shoulders are shrugging. Um, and and for, for us, uh, the people that we choose, we don't choose guys who are in the industry already. We choose artists and we change them into techs. So we're looking for people who can, who can draw or do this first, who have this design skills, and then we're teaching them all the tech. Well, they're, they're still uh, connected to it as art, and they don't understand its production yet. And that takes a while um, to understand this is production and someone's paying me a check, and they own it, and they can make the change whenever they want to make the change, um, and I can't fight this. So again, back to that analogy, they're holding on to that baby's leg while I'm throwing that baby out the door. <laughs> the baby's going out the door. It doesn't matter how much you hold it. The baby's going out the door. Um, and, and then it's just having, I pull them over to the side, and I go, are you OK? Like, this is, this is what it is. We do things artistically. We do not do art. We do everything in our power to be proud of the work we do, but we do not create art. This is not yours. You've been hired to do this, and you got to come to the grips with this or you'll never survive. And I think you have like one or two conversations. You might at the most have three of those, um, but they, they sooner or later they get it. And as soon as they get over, for me, the, our crew, as soon as they get over that hurdle, everything works. Everything where they can go, okay, I, I can walk away from this and start a new, new thing. Um, and, and they're amazing. I mean, these guys, I mean, think about that. You come into work and you love the thing you created. And that's the best feeling in the world. There's nothing better than that. Like you walk out and you're like, I freaking did something that did not exist at 10 a.m. And it's the end of the day, it's 7, it's 7 p.m. and I made a new baby. He threw out my baby yesterday, <laughs> but I made a better baby today and hopefully he doesn't throw it out tomorrow. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's navigating emotions for me.
and in a year, everyone else will get to see your baby, finally. Yes. No. But uh, <laughs> I, I'd like to actually play off of what they both said. Uh, what I've seen in the game industry is that people in HR, for programmers or artists, whatever, they know that a person who is an obstacle, no matter how talented, will set back the entire project. So they want to find people who are not obstacles. And how do you identify that person? It's tricky. It's very difficult. One of the things I've found that helps are people who are willing to do and redo and redo and keep working on something to make it better are often those people who will not be the obstacles. They're the people who will help facilitate everybody else along the way. So giving a person a project and having them do it a number of times and seeing that they're not fighting and kicking the whole way tends to be a good indicator uh, for me. Uh, I want to briefly touch on budget. I want to go really in depth on budget. We've, in the game industry, there's kind of a rule of thumb that your, your, your run rate is how many people you need for how long at a, whatever rate. So for instance, if I was hiring Dean for a month at $100,000, my run enough. rate's <laughs> not enough, Andrew. <laughs> ah, trying to get a discount here today. <laughs> Trying to trick them into it. My run rate would be 100,000, so that'd be my budget. But there are other things that often come in, the equipment. For you guys, it's the training that yeah. comes in that you have to keep in mind. Are there other budget factors that uh, art directors, creative leads, et cetera, should keep in mind when they're trying to put together a budget that'll actually succeed? Can I add something that oh. makes no sense? <laughs> I think you can. I think you have that capability. <laughs> Pizza and bagels. <laughs> Um, there are so many little things that we do um, to keep the guys n just happy um, to the extent that we can. Uh, and we started with uh, Bagel Monday and Pizza Friday, and there's always snacks, and there's always drinks, and there's always um, things to to do. They have and we real Mountain Dew. Yeah. <laughs> and we're always stocking the fridge and stuff like that. And it was funny, all of that was fine, and we had, and, and we were talking earlier about ebbs and flows, Chris and I were talking about um, the industry, how it goes up and down and up and down, and we had one of those ebbs, <laughs> and we sat and had a, a meeting on bagels. Uh, where, and I mean, like, this is not like a, a casual meeting. This is like, what are the ramifications of not having bagels? Eliminating the bagels. Yeah, because we did, because we did the budget, and we're like, oh my God, do you know how much bagels cost? Do you know how much pizza costs? And do you know how much this and that and all these sodas? Because we're going every week, uh, and and it was funny that you're you're not thinking about this in your budget. You're not thinking about in the middle of your budget. You might not have the people you thought you had. You might go, okay. I thought I had the 3D modeler to, to build this stuff, um, but now we need, to, we need to level up. And a lot of the times, I think it's the unknowns. It's the unknowns that you hit in the middle of a project. Um, it might be the situation where you have a project that you thought you had a handle on, and then all of a sudden the ask is different, and the client isn't going to budge on their budget and you're so far into the project that you're like, okay, we have to finish this. We have to, we have to move budgets around. Um, so it's those unknowns and those minor things that, that always creep in. Uh, and I think now we actually have, uh, we call it, I don't know if I can say this out loud, but I'm going to do it out loud. Billy's saying no. <laughs> Leah's saying no. Can, do, we got, do we got another? Do we got another? Christian's Christian yes. saying yes. Yeah. Christina? <laughs> yes or no? Christina did not help you. But I'm saying she said yes, and I'll be the tiebreaker. Uh, we call it the Dunkelberger fee. <laughs> the Dunkelberger fee is you're going to be a pain in my ass. So before, and we find this out in the interview process with our clients. <laughs> <laughs> you should have said no before. <laughs> and it's basically you're going to be uh, uh, a fly in the ointment. So I'm attack on 10% because I know you're going to cost me 20. And we, we actually put that in because we lost so much money on a project. Um, and I'm still not over it. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see Billy's foot twitching back there. <laughs> so yeah, those are the type of things that come in. Chris? Uh, well, at Floyd, we have a great HR lady who takes care of the, the birthday cakes and the, the pizza Fridays and, the, <laughs> and all of that stuff. I don't have to, to deal with that myself. Um, you know, mainly what I'm budgeting is time. And that was true when I was in, in gaming. Uh, I, I had to make sure that the trains ran on time. So I was dealing with, you know, how many, how many people 
do I have and, and where can I put them? And sometimes you are spectacularly wrong. Uh, it, it happened just this last season on Archer. We, uh, it was a film noir season and uh, we're in the 1940s in Los Angeles, a place we've never been before. And the style of storytelling changed slightly. Adam Reed was giving us scripts where Archer and the policemen are driving around the streets of Los Angeles giving exposition as they go to the next scene. And suddenly, we're having to put together these massive moving backgrounds, you know, like the old movie where their rear projection of the road behind them as they sit in pantomime doing this. That's what we're delivering. And we're having to build miles and miles of 1940s Los Angeles from scratch that we've never had to deal with before. You know, usually we do just a little bit of that, you know, over the course of a season. Now it's, it's consuming my department to do that. And um, we, had to, we had to really punt. We had to, we had to pull people off of modeling and put them on making moving backgrounds. And fortunately, by that point in the season, we had the flexibility to do that. And it all worked out fine, and we didn't miss a deadline, and it was great. But everybody, including me, was sweating bullets. So, you know, it's, it's really tricky sometimes to have a handle on what you're budgeting for. It, you know, on paper, the season didn't look much different from all the other seasons. There was the same amount of action. There'd be a couple of episodes that were really going to be, you know, massive efforts for us to do. But it was just this little addition to each episode that snowballed. So uh, that's my big budgeting nightmare is when I don't have enough people. Because I don't, I don't count the beans at Floyd County. I, you know, I can recommend cheaper beans to the guy who does, <laughs> but, you know. Oh, that's a, uh, yeah, yeah, cheaper beans. Don't cut the locks. Whatever you do, keep locks. Get rid of the bagels, but serve the locks. Uh, I'll say one other thing is that when you are budgeting both time and money, and in game side, if there is any new tech you're bringing in, make sure you put that buffer in for the new technology. We learned this very early when Microsoft would roll out new operating systems that developed for new consoles, and there's going to be a new Unity coming out. Uh, when you're moving into VR from having done traditional uh, PC development, definitely budget extra for that ramp up time. Yes, you think you can do it in three months, but no. You think you'd be done for 100,000, but no. Add that comfort level on in and be ready to deal effectively because you don't know what will go wrong at that point. All right, um, I think we're about at the uh, 15 minute point, so we're going to open it up for questions from the stream, from the audience as well. Before we do that, I did want uh, Chris specifically to talk a little bit about the differences in the art production between interactive and non-interactive. I know most of the folks who are watching this are involved in interactive media, but I certainly want to get a sense of where does it differ. Certainly the pipeline is somewhat different. On game side, when you're doing art, you'll have a concept artist. They'll do the concept art. They'll then, in a bigger company, hand it off to a modeler who will build the actual frame, to someone who'll do the textures, and to the uh, rigger and animator, and then to the level designers or programmers, whoever's going to put it all together at the end. So um, in general, what are the differences between interactive production and non? Uh, you're still in a, a pipeline that, that follows some of that. Uh, on Archer, you know, we get, we get storyboards and design sketches, and we start to build, and then we texture. Uh, we, have, we have cars that have to be rigged. Those cars are animated. We have, a, we have animation, modeling, and texturing in my department. Then it goes out to the next step in the pipeline. Uh, you know, and so instead of going out to level designers who assemble it, it goes to compositors. So that part of it isn't as different from gaming. But what is different is that there's a freedom that comes from not working with software as your end product. You're not worrying about whether your textures are on twos or whether your polygon count is a certain amount. Uh, although we have exceeded our polygon count and seen it on the render farm and you know had some nail biting uh, renders going through there clogging everything up. Uh, but as far as that goes, it's, it's very much the same. There, you're, not, you're not in cycles of testing. 
you're in cycles of notes. You know, the work on Archer is assigned out by the art directors. They carry it until all the, the elements are handed off to the compositors, and then the producers come in and look at it from a storytelling standpoint. So at that point, you start getting notes on what's working, what's not working. Uh, and so we have to go in and troubleshoot that in much the way you would in an interactive environment. Uh, it's, it's a little less technical. It's a little more, you know, come up with an idea and how can we put up a show on the barn and, and save this scene that isn't quite working? Can we cut a few seconds here? It's, it's, not, uh, it's not quite the environment you are when you're making games, but it has a lot of the same challenges. Um, I, I think those things are, are similar. Now, to get back to what Dean said at the beginning, you know, the other job I did was an illustrator, and working as an artist as an illustrator, you get into those situations that you found yourself in where a client is just... In, 10%. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a big challenge. Uh, you know, dealing with clients, if you are the person who has to directly deal with a client, you know, that's, that's as much of your job as doing the art. Yeah. You know, you are spending as much time keeping them happy as you are actually sitting with your butt in a chair painting. So, uh, and, or marketing yourself for the net, try and find the next client or, or, you know, whatever it is. Or dealing with the client who just bailed on you or didn't pay his bills or, you know, told you you were doing a great job and then gave you a pink slip 30 seconds later. And, you know, that I could, that's a whole extra set of war stories I could go into. But, in terms of production graphics, where when you're on a team making a product, whether it is a game or a television show, uh, you know the, the challenges are are really similar. They, the I think the the scheduling is a little bit different. I'm not on a monthly milestone that I was when I was in game development because that's how that company worked. But you know, at the end of six weeks, we've got to have an episode ready and in the can so we can do the next one. So. And actually, do you focus just on one episode for six weeks, or do you have different groups at different stages in the next episode? Or yeah, episode? yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a production line. So each department is working on on their set of challenges for an episode for a period of weeks, and then it goes to the next group and the next group, and it gets composited and tested and sent out the door to FX. So, uh, and, and one of the things that is very challenging in television is because you are on a tight pipeline a lot of that work is being done simultaneously so we don't have a big pre-production phase the script comes in people scramble to sketch out designs you're working on rough designs to do your 3d uh, environments and it's the situation you were talking about you're doing some of the design work in 3d which is an expensive way to do it but we don't have the time to do it any other way uh, a little, little more lax now that we're down to you know eight or ten episodes a season. When it was thirteen episodes a season, and you're doing two shows simultaneously, and you're uh, in space. Yeah, and you're and you're in space suddenly because you never know. Uh, you don't know where Adam Reed is going to send you, but you know you can't let the guy down. You know, so uh, you're going to do your best to get Archer in space or under the ocean or in the 1940s or whatever it is, and. Uh, and it's, you know, it's part of the fun of it, really, but it's also a lot of the long hours of it. All right, before we turn it over to the internet and to our crowd, Dean, any other last secrets? Fire away. Um, I, think, I think one of the things that, that you have to do, so, so we're not doing a show, we're, we're usually doing projects and we're working with clients, uh, is we've evolved into this. When we started this whole thing, Billy and I, I think we were both involved with talking to the clients. And what happened in our workflow was the clients were giving me information or giving him information. Um, and it started getting really, really mixed up. And I would have a certain piece of information that would go to Billy. But in that email was also something that went to me. I wouldn't notice that it got CC'd or 
uh, he was getting stuff for me. And even it started happening with our freelancers where they didn't understand the, the hierarchy, I guess. And the freelancers were getting direct calls. So we didn't even know what they were working on. So, but they're in the building. <laughs> Like, they're in the back room working on something because the client called them direct, directly, but the client doesn't know where we are with the project, and we don't know that a change has just been made that affects everything. So it's kind of like that Jenga where someone came in um, and, you know, pulled out a piece and then ran out the building and no one knows. And then when we go to edit something, it's like, where the hell is this? Or what the hell we're going to composite? And there's something missing or there's something added. And instead of um, maybe a 30 second spot, now we have a, uh, a 40 second spot and we don't know how it got there. And somewhere last year, it was just like, okay, here's the rules. You go to him. <laughs> and I even to the point where uh, I adopted that I do not check my phone anymore. <laughs> I do not check my email uh, so that no one goes and talks to me um, because what happens is, is um, miscommunication. And miscommunication costs money. So everyone who works with us, I mean, our first meeting, uh, in our first meeting, on our first client meeting is don't text Dean. He will not text <laughs> you back. Don't call <laughs> Dean. He will not pick up the phone for you. Do not email him. He's got 4,000 unanswered emails because he's not allowed <laughs> to interact with you anymore. <laughs> uh, don't email anybody but Billy. And it has been so great because there's one flow of information coming in. Um, there is one stream of consciousness saying, okay, this is what this has to do. And if we're working on multiple projects that don't really coincide with each other in any sort of way, um, you need... You need that one person going, okay, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I think we've saved a lot of money by doing that. I think we've saved a lot of time. I think a lot of people think I'm crazy or mean because I don't answer. I will, Sarah. <laughs> I will answer your text. Uh, uh, but I do it because it makes the workflow better. And that's a crazy thing to think that's the thing we had to do to actually make workflow better because it's not the norm for us. Actually, that's not crazy, and this is an important one in game development. There has to be, no matter how big the team, in the end, there has to be one person who owns the vision. We did this at HDI where we'd have three to four projects running at a time, three to four games in development, and we have four directors at the company all giving input, and everyone in the company giving input, but one person was designated as owning the vision for that game, and especially for the look feel as well as the gameplay, it's critical. One person makes that final determination. This does or does not fit in. They have to take input. They can't. It's not a dictatorial role. It is you are the source all the input goes to, and then you tell how it's going to end up working. I think that's key uh, in game development. All right, do we have any questions coming in from mixer.com slash ggda? Last. All right. We're about to find out. <laughs> Apparently they love it at Sprocket. <laughs> Scrum Creative. So tell us, uh, Dean, tell us about Scrum at Scrum Creative. We love rugby. So, so, <laughs> so, so one of the recruiters uh, from, uh, I, it wasn't your company. Uh, one of the recruiters were looking for scrum operators and scrum managers, and I had no idea what it was, but I loved the word, and I refused to look it up. <laughs> so the whole day, I was basically walking around just going, scrum! <laughs> we need to get a scrummer in here. <laughs> we need scrummage. We got scrum jobs. We got scrum deadlines. I'm having scrum for lunch. <laughs> and uh, I think I might have kept that going a little bit too long to everybody's <laughs> irritation. I, I still have no idea what it is. It went to uh, scrum, 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 eggs I, and scrum. I thank you for the question on my end because that will be tomorrow's topic for the whole day. And we, again, will refuse to Google it <laughs> because I would like it to be a mystery. So, no, I have no idea what it is. Chris, you got any comments? No. All right. No. So, I'm Scrum, out. sorry, Dean, cover your ears, you're going to learn. So, Scrum is a term that comes from rugby. So, this is when both, if you ever watch rugby, it's much more violent than American football. This is the point when both herds of giant people crash into each other, fighting over the sports ball. 
and wrestle and go crazy for it. And eventually they break apart. One person grabs it and runs and runs until suddenly it all comes together and it's crushing them together again. So the idea in game development methodology is you are supposed to bring the scrum together to talk about what you're doing. Everybody gets their specific assignment. They break out of the scrum, do their assignment, and then come back together uh, as in a scrum in order to talk about what they've done, throw out what didn't work, move forward with what did work, and so forth. Uh, in programming, coders who I've uh, dealt with, specifically uh, Ken Leitner, CCP, and others, talk about how it is supposed to work most effectively when everybody has a similar skill set and anyone can do the different jobs that the scrum is assigning out. So while Dean might have a job and I've got a job, we should both be able to do them and therefore can comment effectively on what everyone else is doing and really understand what has been accomplished when we come back together. What I see happen far too often is that you will have teams come in, we've got artists, you've got designers, you've got programmers, you've got testers, and nobody can do anyone else's job, but they're coming together as a scrum, they leave with their assignments, but nobody can really comment intelligently on what the others have done. So I think scrum can work and does work. There are some teams that do very well with scrum methodology, but you do best when it's people who have a strong understanding of each other's roles, skills, and abilities, and have some uh, cross-skill training and, and, and a strong understanding. I never recommend it for a new team or a team that has not successfully launched a game. It really is something that's better when you have gotten some projects under your belt and you understand not only what you can do right, but what can go wrong. Because if you don't know what's going wrong when you're just doing a scrum, you'll never know until it's too late because they just don't know how to communicate it. So uh, if you have other questions on Scrum, we'll, we'll go ahead and say Scrum, 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 Baked Beans, and Scrum for the rest of the day. <laughs> can, I, can I add to that? Yeah. Okay. So now that I He's know what say Scrum, Scrum, Scrum. Yeah. <laughs> now that I know what it is, <laughs> I can actually talk on it intelligently. Uh, <laughs> so I had, I had these notes, um, and the funny thing is... Scrum is on it. It is. Wow. Sadly, it is. Um, so... Uh, everybody in the shop has different skill sets. Uh, some are stronger than others in those skill sets. But whenever we start a project, the first thing you'll see on my little uh, production workflow is train. Uh, and what that means is whoever doesn't have the knowledge, uh, well, not that kind of train. <laughs> Whatever uh, person who doesn't have the knowledge, um, they stop down and they train. So if that's Cinema 4D, uh, even though they might not know Cinema 4D, they take two weeks and they sit down with Cinema 4D so that they can understand the process. So if they don't know if we get a new plug-in or anything like that, uh, they learn it enough to just have discussions involved in it. Uh, and the reason we do that is because when we get together or we scrum, I guess, you people do. I don't like the word either, Leah. I'm sorry. I'm going to. Now we're scrumming every day, guys. Uh, we are scrumming from 10 to 1030. It's a guarantee. Um, so, but, but being totally serious. Uh, so every day when we have this meeting, uh, we discuss what we're all doing and where everybody's at so that everybody can intelligently talk to each other and also give some ideas. So if uh, Christian's working on something with... Uh, particles or with dynamics and Christina might know the answer, she has a chance to chime in. But we, we schedule it only once a day, basically, and we do it if someone has a problem. Uh, we'll actually stop down and I think one of the problems, we had a job where we had to do a, a Plinko board uh, and it was talking about expensive things um, and it was just a simple, the balls falling down the Plinko board and bouncing around. And in, in theory, it was the easiest thing in the world. Uh, but none of us really knew dynamics like we should have known dynamics. And these balls were flying all over the game board and knocking down other characters and shooting out everywhere. Or they were coming down in this big, massive, uh, well, I don't want to say big, massive balls, but big, <laughs> massive balls <laughs> going through the Plinko board. Uh, and we stopped down. And everybody had to do dynamics. Everybody had to get a different tutorial and learn dynamics, and I think after an hour, everybody just came back to it and solved it. Um, so we don't have a terminology for it. Uh, we call it fixing shit. Uh, <laughs> we we don't give it cool letters, um, but yeah, but yeah, we scrum. We're proud scrummers. A little bit different, but yeah. 
<laughs> Dean will be saying Scrum for the. Oh, How much no. is Scrum showing up in chat? Is, is Scrum just eat, taking over chat now? Is it just Scrum, Scrum, Scrum? Oh, great. All right, tonight's raid call will be hashtag Dean Scrum when we uh, raid another channel tonight. <laughs> Dean, hashtag Dean Scrum. Tweet it out now. All right. Uh, Paul, do we have questions from the, our audience? Anyone in the audience have questions, comments? I'll we'll start with Joe over there in the back. No, 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 wait for the mic, wait for the mic. <laughs> Say nothing. Okay, I was just gonna comment on Scrum briefly too, the way I understood it. And it was useful enough, and it sounded like you're doing mostly Scrum, and we, we had three rules for Scrum. You, you, you stand up while you do it. You're only allowed to do three things. You say what you got accomplished since the last scrum meeting, which is usually yesterday. You say what you're going to accomplish until the next scrum meeting. And you talk about blockers, which is a very effective thing, is if anybody else in the group is preventing you um, from doing what you need to get done or solving a problem. And for that, it's useful, although in general, I kind of hated scrum. But, <laughs> you know. and, you know, that's, that's all I wanted to say. And you were working so, in a programming environment, right? All, you were all coders who could kind of deal with each other. No, problems, no, no, not really. Uh, you want producers there, too. You, want, you definitely want people that can solve your problem. And uh, we even had QA there, and, but it was quick. You know, and really, you, you, you don't even talk as, and babble as long as I did. It, it has to be quick. It has to be, if it's, if it's longer than 15 minutes, you're not doing it right. And it's got to be quick. Can I ask a question on that? Sure. You said there's blockers. Do the, you guys get like infighting if you're like, hey, Sally over there, <laughs> blocker. <laughs> she's not giving me what I need. And then she's over there going, Joe, later tonight. <laughs> I know no, it, a car it's you more have. Like, it's, it's more like um, I need a change in the framework to do something in my game code. And the framework people have lower prioritized me. Oh, okay. And it's preventing me. You know, they're, they, they haven't put in the feature I need to finish off doing what I'm doing, and the producer might go, you know, that's higher priority. So, I think it's one of those things, Dean, where if you, if you don't have a blocker, you're the blocker. That's most <laughs> every day. <laughs> All right, Franklin, you had a question. If you want to take it back there, and then we'll go back to the, uh, to the chat. So get your questions ready. And uh, we'll blockers over there. Yeah, Thank people you. are blocking him. And the, I think part of the reason the term blockers is, again, rugby terminology. You mentioned earlier about the process of how your company or, or team had works. How you've mentioned um, in the art field, you guys work mostly artistically, not art. Uh, any chance you can elaborate that? Oh, before I do, though, mine says for a minute, I thought. I thought from what you said is, I thought maybe it was like, um, your team is more um, passion and creation based, not just, it's not like a tech company based, it's like, uh, say, id software was, something like that. Like, more like an eye on storm path. Um, so you are, you're totally, totally correct. Uh, we are more um, artistically based, and then we follow up with the tech. Um, so, uh, in, in the motion graphics industry, there's not really, uh, I don't think there's as much tech involved as the gaming in so far as we don't need programmers. Um, but we're starting to venture forth into 360 environments and, and 360 storytelling. Um, and we were scared off for a really long time, to be totally honest, because the first thing that we started talking about was Unity and Unreal. And we're not programmers. Uh, some of us can't even read. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and some of us can't even spell. <laughs> so <you> programming. <laughs> so so trying to actually to 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 learn that was a, a new topic for us. So we disbanded it, but we wanted to be in this space. So our solution was heck. Ju let's just create a story first. Let's actually just create characters. Let's do this. Let's do that. Um, and we kind of just fell in love with our own story and our own characters to the point where it's like oh. Uh, it kind of needs some freaking tech. <laughs> and we learned what we could. Uh, we researched. We, we did uh, as much reading as our eyes would let us before we put the books down. Uh, and we found other solutions to, to do what we needed to do. But w any project that we come to is, is never about the tech first. 
Um, it's always about the actual content. It's always about the story. We know that if we can't get around to the tech, we can hire people like you guys to actually do the tech. Um, but we, we, it, we are hard pressed to find people who can do content effectively. We're hard pressed to find, uh, we can find p good artists, but we're hard pressed to find um, good idea people, which is, which is surprising. Uh, and I think the problem is it's, it's not a focus in school. Um, school is a focus of, you know, you can learn how to program and you can learn how to do 3D and you can learn how to illustrate and you can do all of these things. Um, but for an artist, an illustrator, um, they're not taught while they're, they're doing that to how to take their story. Um, so for me, when, when we get involved with this, it's, it's all about content. It's content, content, content. It's storytelling. It's emotion. Like, how do we put an emotion into something that's, uh, it's not alive. I think Archer does that freaking incredibly. I mean, Archer is so story driven, emotion driven. Now, it's a beautiful piece, but it's, the content is just stunning. Um, the stories are stunning. So for us, it's keeping that passion. Um, and the people that we choose to work with us uh, usually come with that passion anyway. I mean, we're, the, our apprentice program starts with only four people. It never gets higher. And um, as they go through, you know, then they become contractors for us. But we weed them out for can they tell a story? Can they effectively uh, keep the passion uh, in, in this when they're thrown into production? Because they're not ready for that. Usually, there are these really effective uh, artists that have never been told that needs to be done today. Like, no kidding, today, or I'm letting you go. Um, because I have no options at that point. Because our deadline says on my schedule, today, and I know you can do it. Um, and as long as uh, we have that good story, when we don't even get the artwork that we need, we know if we have a, a decent story, we can kind of carry through that that flow so yeah we're we're totally passion driven uh art driven and uh we make up you know our lack of tech with with good content all right one last i realize we're pretty heavily over time so one last question from the internet and then lots of cool announcements do we have anything from the mixer.com yeah, we had somebody ask earlier, and uh, this was their wording. Um, so what keeps you guys working in this space, and specifically towards gaming versus a normal job? I'm not qualified to do a normal job. I couldn't function in a normal job. I think Chris hit the first nail right on the head. I can do face painting besides this. I am, I am comfortable in a short order cook position. Uh, I have been known to drop a, a fry or two into a greaser. Uh, other than that, I have no other capabilities besides this. Uh, if, you, if, if we were unemployed today, I would be homeless, and I would probably live in the back <laughs> in an old Mac box <laughs> that I've taped together. <laughs> I'd probably make a cardboard Mac computer, <laughs> and I'd end my days like that. I have no other skills. Yeah, uh, you know, Going on the convention circuit, I talk to a lot of artists, and there's only one reason to be an artist, and that's because you have no choice. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, if you can do anything else, an electrician, a plumber, do that. You know, don't, don't do this job. Uh, you know, and, I, and I, I, artists would write me and say, you know, hey, I'm seeing your stuff on games. It's like, how do you, how do you get your start? And it's like... Can you do anything else? Because really, you know, I'm, I'm about to rain on your parade. I mean, you're, you're not going to want to write me back. But, you know, do something else. If you can't, then you are an artist. And now <laughs> you are stuck walking this path. And, and good luck to you. And, you know, be as diverse as you can because you don't know where the money is going to be. So. But one thing Dean said is also very true about throwing out the baby and creating a new baby. At the end of the day, you've got a baby you really love, and not only you love it, but you want to show this baby to a lot of other people. And when other people love your baby, that's a great feeling, too. So with that, announcements. Uh, thank you all for watching us. This is our monthly GGDA Atlanta meeting. Uh, we'll have another stream on Thursday, probably a playtest of Fading Sun's Noble Armada, 7 p.m. Eastern, all day Saturday. If you're in Columbus, Georgia, if you're part of our Columbus Continued Watching Now, we will see you 
you at SimFest. There are going to be some great sessions. We'll have them up on the channel description here on Mixer.com slash CGDA. So uh, it should be up pretty soon, but all day Saturday, 9 to 5.30, great sessions on game development. Next Tuesday, we have an interview with one of the sound wizards at Wabi Sabi Sound, the folks behind Ori and the Blind Forest and other great games. So uh, definitely be ready for that one. Our next GGD Atlanta meeting will be August 8th at 22 Tech Park, which is a new incubator starting to incubate game companies. I believe uh, that um, uh, there's at least one game company already there and uh, maybe others in-house. So we'll be talking about how to have a successful game startup. So definitely join us for, for that one. On July 22nd, we'll be doing a game design workshop from the Microsoft Store at Perimeter Mall. Uh, tune in for us on Mixer for that one. You can either attend. It's aimed at a high school audience. Anyone can take part. So if you really want to know about physics, come on out, Dean. But uh, <laughs> definitely join us for that or watch it again live on uh, live on Beam. Uh, Siege is October 6th to 8th. You can register now for it. Again, Jesse Shell is one of our keynotes for that. It's going to be a great event. <laughs> and obviously we have some fans here. And uh, is, does anyone from the audience have a particular announcements, hirings, or anything like that? Uh, Oh, that's right. Uh, for those of you here in Atlanta, the uh, game developer meetup, is it a joystick or at... Uh, it's going to be a joystick game bar in, uh, on Edgewood. So check that out. 7, p uh, 7 p.m., though, if you get there early, Joe might buy you a drink or try and beat you in some game. And uh, uh, with that, oh, DreamHack is coming up uh, the weekend after SimFest. And, of course, DragonCon will be on Labor Day weekend. So we'll be involved with all of those. Uh, I'm doing a presentation at DreamHack. I, I I'm know, too. I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. Yeah, same here. But I'm there. Oh, oh, I know the topic. I just don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so Dean and I will be a dream hack, so feel free to join us. I'll be talking somewhat on eSports because we're the Georgia eSports League. We'll be talking about more there. And Dean will be there talking about being an eSports competitor because <laughs> uh, apparently not. <laughs> I didn't right. know what a Waka Flocka was. Oh, man. <laughs> you are so 2016. I, I thought it was like an Xbox <laughs> One game. <laughs> so thank you all for tuning in. Thank all of you for joining us here tonight. And we'll see everybody uh, next month. And thanks to our panelists. <laughs>